Hi everyone, on behalf of Go Virtual Office and Tadpole, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I'm Chrissy Allard, the Marketing Manager at GVO, and I will let everybody else introduce themselves. Jenny, you wanna go? Hi everybody, my name is Jenny Mueller and I am Director of Sales and Partnerships here at Tadpole. Chris, you wanna? Sure, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, hey everyone, thanks for taking the time. My name is Chris Davis, uh, Solutions Architect over here at Tadpole. So um, basically what that means for you guys is uh, working really closely with clients on cross-channel growth plans, um, ideal channel mixes, and then also technology roadmaps as well. So excited to be chatting with you guys today. Todd, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks Chris. Hi everybody, my name is Todd Parrish. I'm the, the, the Director of the Managed Application Services for uh, Go Virtual Office. I've been involved with NetSuite for uh, going on almost the last 10 years. I spent a lot of time in e-commerce, back office setup, and uh, I oversee our Boost product now where we do Managed Application Services and uh, continuing to build out NetSuite accounts as they come over from our delivery team. All right, thanks guys. So we obviously have our subject matter experts here and I'm just going to start rattling off the questions that you guys all submitted. Um, and if we have time, we'll get to the other questions you guys submit throughout the um, today. And then I will route this recording to you um, probably by tomorrow. And then uh, if you ever have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're gonna start these office hours and it's gonna be a series of events. So we'll continue to have these so if anything comes up and you have a question, we're always here um, to help you guys out. So Todd, I'm gonna start with you. Um, what do you recommend in for establishing a good system with clean data, um, especially like when you have multiple systems in place, like where do you even start? Yeah, so one of the reasons why we have such a great relationship with Tadpole is really because of data. And that's one of the great things about NetSuite is that it's very data rich. And as far as like where do you start is really, I guess it's almost, we, you have to jump to the end. Where do you wanna get? So what are you trying to get out of that system and what's really important to you? And what are your, those, those strategic um, values that you really desire so that you can make management decisions? Now, you know, gross profit, revenue, item sales, stuff like that, that's really great and that's really important. But what I see is really important is to dive deeper to that. Is there a certain channel that you want to see on a customer record? Is there certain attributes on an item that you want to track? Maybe it's from a particular vendor or from a particular country. Uh, maybe you're doing sourcing where you want to talk about, hey, this, this uh, product is sourced from this country. You want to really you know, share that data without or report on it. So really is what are the individual data fields that really tie into your strategic business decisions that you make and also reporting on where you're at and, and how successful that is. Chris, do you have anything to add about why unifying data is so important? Yeah, no, totally. And so I, I think, you know, when I think about why unifying data is important to me, it's really the first step in being a data driven organization, which is obviously something we're big proponents of, um, especially when it comes to e-commerce and digital marketing. And so uh, along those lines, too, it's also definitely going to be the best way that you're going to identify like anomalies and holes in your data. And so um, as an example, right, perhaps you have conversion rates that are well within the standard, like say like one to two percent, for instance, but maybe you have a really high return rate on the other side. And just as an example, right, if you weren't tracking that return rate, which likely isn't in some of your daily analytics platforms, you might not be able to auger into what is probably a miss on the, you know, customer expectation side where maybe there's an issue with like sizing or descriptions, those kinds of things. And so um, I think along those lines too, right, the different parts of the business are going to tell different parts of the story, right? So finance, ops, product, um, retail, obviously the whole e-commerce and digital marketing side, they're all going to see the business through um, kind of a different keyhole. And so you know, with that being said, like some really common pitfalls we see there would be like, for instance, running campaigns against pro against products that might have either low inventory or broken sizing, for instance, which is, you know, a case of marketing, not talking to ops, or perhaps you're running discounts without considering the margin structure and cost per acquisition and lifetime value, which is in, you know, in that case, finance and marketing, probably not communicating uh, properly. And so, you know, one of my favorite analogies that we talk a little bit about Tadpole is it's kind of like going to your general practitioner where you're going to need like your blood work, your x-rays, your MRI. You need a lot of different types of data to be able to see if you're kind of healthy. And I would say on the business front, there's a lot of parallels to that where, again, if you're only looking through one keyhole, you're probably going to kind of miss the forest through the trees there. So that's always kind of my take on it as far as just a great place to start for being a data-driven organization. 
Yeah, and, and to add to that, Chris, I think that analogy is really good because not all numbers are the same and not all records are the same and not all data points are the same. And, you know, when we have people that are moving, say, from a QuickBooks or things of, you know, that type of platform to a true ERP like NetSuite, there's, there's a whole different record structure that a lot of people don't think about. And when you start looking at, like, custom fields in NetSuite, well, you have customer records, you have item records, you have transaction records that where are you tracking those data on those different points and you mentioned like customer lifetime value that's a great one because that is going to live on the customer record but that is still tied to that that transaction data and that item data as well so the customer you know lifetime value is great but how are you doing that specifically and a great example from the nest suite world is there's a free suite app called customer lifetime value and then you can go ahead and set that up in NetSuite and it'll calculate that customer lifetime value and auto-populate that on the customer. But what's great is that it's powered by a search engine, uh, safe search in the background that you can say what items you want calculated into that customer lifetime value. Say that you're a company that, you know, you sell products, but your products really aren't your profit center. But you want to know what the service revenue is from that particular customer you can create a safe search. It only looks at those data points that you want to tell that story that really matters to your business. So that's a great example of customer lifetime value that is taking apart though that item data, but then it's populating that data on the customer record. All really good points. Yeah, I like those analogies. So some people I know had um, written in about how do you, you know, once you have the data, what can you do with it? Can you tell some customer stories or how people have put the data to work for them? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think it's, that's a really good point. And I'm really glad that that came up because we talk a lot internally at Tadpole as far as, you know, dashboards are is basically where data goes to die, right? And so essentially, if you're not actually using that data actively, it's probably not providing a lot of value for your business. Um, and so with that being said, I would, I would actually start from more of like a process oriented piece of that, where honestly using data effectively starts with what your, your daily, your weekly, your monthly, and your quarterly cadences look like. And then I think also just becoming really fluent in your KPIs, your key performance indicators, and feeling like you have a really good sense of being basically fluent in those things. Um, and so with that being said, like as an example, right, like some of the data that's probably going to be really important, really actionable might be around like customer life cycles. So for instance, like if we say, like maybe you have a higher price point item that you know is going to take a whole lot of nurturing to get to that first purchase. And then it's going to take a whole lot of nurturing again to get to that second purchase. Like maybe it takes, let's just say it takes like 44 days, for instance, to go from the first to the second purchase. Okay, well, that's that's totally then going to be able to drive our marketing cadences. For instance, we know we're probably not going to think about retargeting somebody five days after their first purchase if we know that that life cycle is generally speaking going to be much longer. Um, I think the other thing too that's really important is when you have, um, when you are a data-driven organization, it also lets you do a lot more testing, which is obviously going to make you more, you know, more effective, all else equal, um, in the future. So, you know, on the email side, for instance, that's everything from, you know, testing pop-ups, subject lines, you know, send times, day of week, all of those things. I would say similarly when it comes to paid SEO and referral too, testing different content types, descriptions, titles, utilizing again, time of day and day of week. So as an example, right, you might be willing to pay more to acquire a customer in a certain time of year, or you might be willing to pay more for a cost per click at a certain time of day based on, um, you know, when you know those, those conversions are happening. So I think, you know, as long as you have those processes in place and you can be fluent in those KPIs and those KPIs might be different compared to, you know, your different organization, but that's definitely going to be the start as far as being being able to actually utilize that data versus just kind of looking at it in a pretty dashboard, which can feel good, but probably isn't super actionable. So, Todd, this one's probably more up your alley. Uh, what are some good questions to ask a vendor prior, prior to picking out an ERP? Yeah, you know, and, and to me, I, I, I think this applies to more than there's just an ERP, but really, if you're looking for like a reporting package or tools like what Tadpole has. To me, it's first off, what's that implementation methodology look like? Okay, so if I am a customer, what does that roadmap look like? And specifically, how do you how do you mandle, manage changes? Um, because really, it, it's really important to, you know, because, you know, everybody has a great game plan. The first day you have your kickoff meeting, it's every, the world's your oyster. And then you start to get into the details. And, 
And what a lot of people don't realize is that when you're changing an ERP, you're changing your business. Now that sounds great and it is great, but what you're doing is you're changing your business processes as well. And you're asking a lot of your staff to change those business processes that you've built out over the last five, 10, 15 years. And, and that's great, but there's really friction in that process. So having that implementation methodology is great to have a general roadmap, but then you're gonna have pivots that you have to make. How do you handle those and how do you manage to change management once those things are in place. So really understanding how that flows, a lot of that depends um, really on the partner that you're working with. And that's really, but you know, when I look at, when you're looking at a vendor is really, what industries have they served in, okay? And the one mistake that I see a lot of people say, it was like, well, I only wanna work with somebody who's worked in my, my vertical. Okay, I, I understand why people say that, but what I've really seen is that, you know, myself, I've probably worked with 10 to 15 different verticals over my career at GBO. And I can honestly say that there's things that I've learned from one vertical that I brought to the table with a totally different vertical that they've never thought of doing that. You know, whether it's like, hey, you know, in, in software, NPS or net promoter score may be a really big deal, but a wholesale distribution company has never thought about an NPS. Well, why is that any different? So functionality that we built out with MPS in one vertical works great for another and can be a really good differentiator. So to me, yes, you wanna have vertical experience in what they're doing, but don't discount what they can bring to uh, you know, provide some cross-pollination. I, I think GBO has been a great resource for the companies that have really cross-branded with product to service or service to product, and that's really been a trend. Chris, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think I'm I'm really glad to hear you mention on the net promoter score side, you know, specifically, because I think that definitely is one of those, you know, most important, basically zero, uh, essentially pieces of zero party data. And there's there's so many awesome actionable insights there. So no, I would I would just give a big a big plus one to all of that for sure. Yeah, and, and to tie it back to what you're talking about, your previous question on, on customer data points and talking about customer transactions, et cetera is when you take that MPS score, and then if you're marrying that with the data <clears throat> that you have in NetSuite, you have sales reports, you have financial statements, you have things of that nature, and MPS score is great as it is, but if you can start to marry MPS as it relates to dollar amounts, because, because having a promoter that spends $500 may be nothing compared to a detractor who spends $10,000. So it really takes it to another level where you start to blend that data together and say, okay, where, where are we at with those MPS scores and relate that to the risk? And what is that like if you're looking backwards, we've had so much sales to these you know, promoters, detractors, neutral, then you can start to look at it, not just from a score perspective, but actually a dollar perspective and say, wow, we have a really large amount of detractors that's affecting potentially 35% of our revenue. That, as Chris went, mentioned before, then you can start to build out plans like what do we do with those customers to salvage that to get them to a neutral or a promoter. Yeah, and I would say too, just to kind of echo that a little bit, like there's so much that you can do based on those different cohorts that are, I think, pretty logically um, able to be built off that promoter score. And I think a lot of like, right, you can get really complicated in doing that, but you can also start really simple, right? So you could even just ask, for instance, you know, that subset of people who maybe are detractors, like if you could do some different like long form interviews with those folks, you can gain yeah. some, some really valuable information. And on the other side too, you can also ask your best customers and your biggest fans, like, hey, what about us is, you know, helping you to feel that way about us? And then hopefully you can be able to amplify that out further. The other thing too, that I would also add is, um, you know, again, Net Promoter Score being a great place to start when it comes to customer cohorts. And we could definitely go a lot deeper on some other core, on some other cohorts that you could create based on the data that you're capturing. But you could also then use those to find other folks who are similar to that, right? And so the most basic example might be, okay, let's download a list of all the people who gave us nines and tens in Net Promoter Score. Let's upload that into Facebook and Instagram and do some lookalikes on it and see if we can't capture some, some, some similar but different customers going forward. So I think that there's a ton of actionable insights when it comes to Net Promoter Score in general. And it's, that's probably one of the best places to start when it comes to zero party data, which, which is what you're capturing essentially directly from your customer's voice. Absolutely. So I think we kind of answered the what zero um, party data. Do you have any, um, are you able to leverage with the, 
with uh, the lifetime value of existing customers. Do you have any uh, examples of like first party data, anything like that that you want to add? Oh, for sure. Yeah, totally. And so I guess just just real quick when it comes to kind of the difference between first and zero party data, because honestly, it can there's a lot of nuances in that. And so we think of zero party data as essentially anything that's coming directly from your customer's mouth, right? So something that's something that they're they're directly telling you. So a net promoter score can definitely be one of those. It could also be things like, um, you know, for instance, what they're interested in, right? We could just ask a customer like, hey, what do you use our products for? For instance, they might be using it for um, hunting versus working out versus um, the outdoors, for instance, and you would obviously probably speak to those customers very differently. So those are my, I would say, some of my favorite examples of zero party data. And then on the first party side, again, there's probably, depending on how you ask, there's probably a couple different definitions of what first party data is. Um, at Tadpole, we're definitely going to think about first party data as as basically stuff that's coming from a specifically first party um, analytics platform. So as an example, right, Google Analytics is maybe a little bit in that gray area. With that being said, it is a third party cookie. So you're basically going to be limited to that 30 day look back window, for instance, whereas if you do have a first party cookie on your website, which is loaded directly through your, your, your domain settings, essentially, you're not going to be limited to that. And the other really important thing is that you, you know that customer directly and you could reach out to them. Whereas a Google Analytics, for instance, is basically aggregated data. You couldn't auger into one customer and then reach out to that person. A truly first party analytics platform will allow you to auger into one single customer and you could ask that customer a question should you want to, which at that point would then become zero party data. So um, with that being said, a couple, I think, really important uh, pieces of first party data to, to be thinking about is going to be things like top converting products, gateway products. So, so essentially products that are going to help drive a first purchase versus a second purchase. Um, Cross-sell um, opportunities, so products from, from a different category on the website, or upsell uh, opportunities from within the same category on the website. Um, so yeah, I would say all those things are definitely super important, and we could definitely speak a lot, I think, to some of the specific action items that come with some of those. But um, if there's anything else, anyone else wants to add to that, definitely uh, feel free to do so. Yeah, and the only thing I'll, I'll add to it, you know, Tadpole does a great job in this, and we don't do as much ourselves, but you know, the, the thing that I've learned over the years working with Tadpole is that the, this there is art to it, but there's a really good science to it as well. And, you know, there there are great best practices that they implement, and the best companies that are very successful that, that do, and that there is a lot of tools that you can use, especially small to medium-sized businesses, you know, that it's such a great time for small businesses to be able to afford a package like NetSuite that's a full-blown ERP that's giving them a huge amount of data that you know 10, 15 years ago wasn't even imaginable to a small business. So you can compete, you know, the NetSuite package that we sell the small businesses is the same package, has the same feature and functionality that we do to enterprise businesses. It is the same product. We have different license counts, but it's the same product. So you're able to take, you know, those best practices, you know, that we have in the in the NetSuite data world with Tadpole with marketing and, you know, dynamics, you know, things that you can go and take that and be extremely competitive as a small business that 10, 15 years ago, really nobody had that capability to do at a small business level. Yeah, Todd, I'm super glad you mentioned that because I think that's that's honestly one of probably actually the favorite part about working at a place like Tadpole or, or working with partners like GVO because basically, right, we can help a smaller medium business get the same data that like an Amazon has, for instance. And right, that smaller medium business does have advantages when they have that type of data because you're obviously way closer to your customer versus, you know, working across a million one different verticals. And so I think that's really powerful, right? You can see a company um, basically punching way above its weight class, which I think is really mm -hmm. exciting. I agree. The great way to put it. Yeah, and I think, you know, coming from a marketing perspective, that first party data is going to be so crucial when Google gets away, you know, the third party data is going away and we're all going to have to battle those nuances. And so having those systems in place now is really going to help, you know, your business be more effective. So we do have a couple more questions. I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them, but if we don't, there will be a next session. So, um, Todd, do you want to speak on... Do all ERPs basically have the same features? So I always put out the bias alert that we sell NetSuite and only NetSuite. So NetSuite is the best on the planet. Nobody's ever close. No. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, it's yes and no. And, and really where the yes is, is that 
um, all packages have sales orders. All I, you know, packages have items. They have transaction records and things of that nature. And you know, I've been doing this for a while, so I, like I said, I'm very biased in that suite. But we, a lot of our hires in our managed application service department, we actually hire a lot of people that have a lot of industry experience in in their industry. Not necessarily NetSuite, you know, if they've done NetSuite, that's great if they do, but there's a really big thing for us to have people that have long years of industry experience. And it's always really interesting to keep me relevant on how good NetSuite is. As they go through our onboarding process and learn NetSuite, I'm always very inquisitive. I'm like, how does this compare to this or that that you had had? And it's always really interesting to get that feedback it could be sucking up to the boss, but it is always good that, that NetSuite is so good. But really, it's, it boils down to, and I hear this, this one consistent thread, and this is where I think that NetSuite is, is fantastic, is this flexibility. You know, like for me to create a custom field on a, on a customer record literally takes me five minutes. I can do that. If I need to create a save search or a custom report or do this or that, it's extremely flexible. And I, I've always said night. 90% of NetSuite is extremely flexible, and the last 10% is a concrete wall that you're never going to move or change. Okay, it's just then you've got to know how to get around those walls. And that's where a great part comes into play. But really, this that flexibility, whether it's dashboards, data pieces, transact, creating custom transactions. I can create a custom transaction in about 30 minutes in NetSuite, and I have a new transactional record. That's really, really good, and I really appreciate that. Um, the cloud platform goes, that's been beaten to death. That is true that NetSuite has been on the cloud from day one. They are light years ahead of other packages on that, and that ties in with the database, with the OCI and a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, they, of course, have a great Oracle database in the background. So are they the same? No. Um, but I, I think that NetSuite has a lot of experience in the past. And then really, like I kind of mentioned before, um, I will say this, I think the right partner makes all the world, you know, makes a huge difference. Um, we do a lot of recovery type. It's the same Nestle product that somebody else did, but they didn't have the experience in that or what have you. Uh, having the right partner, regardless of the ERP platform, uh, I think is probably the biggest difference between a successful implementation and not. Yeah, I have to agree. I always feel bad when we get those recovery ones and I'm like, why didn't I get to them sooner? But yeah. um, so I think that's all we have uh, for today. And I just wanna thank everybody again and remind um, you guys to follow us on social. We will have another um, open office on September 14th at 11 Central Standard Time. So submit any questions to us and we would be happy to answer them. Thanks for your time today. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Bye everybody, thanks for having us. You're welcome, bye.